Hey everyone, what you're seeing right now is two illustrations of the complex derivative. On the surface, it may seem identical to the real derivative. The differentiation rules are the same. And the truth is, well, it is. It's just that visualizing the derivative as the slope of a graph doesn't generalize well to complex functions. In this video, we'll use a slight change in perspective to understand what it means to take a complex derivative. My assumptions for this video are that you know about complex numbers and how to work with them, and also that you have some familiarity with the real derivative and linear transformations. But even if you're not too comfortable with any of these topics, I still recommend you give this video a shot. I try my best to cover any holes. The primary problem we have here is that graphing functions of complex variables is impossible in our three-dimensional world. Let's consider a function f of x. We know that the derivative of this function can be interpreted as the slope of this graph. But what if I let x be some complex number z, some input a plus bi? Well, if we consider the input space, we have a complex plane, which is two-dimensional. But the output space is also a complex number, which is another two dimensions needed for this graph. This is where it gets tricky. There are actually many ways by which we can visualize complex functions. For instance, I can graph both the imaginary output and the real output on two different plots. Or I could consider each complex number in the output space as a vector, giving us a vector field. Or I could even graph the magnitude on the z-axis and have color represent the angle. But before we talk about complex derivatives, let's revisit the real derivative. Let's consider a function f of x. The typical visual is to graph this function on the Cartesian plane, take a small step in the x-axis called dx, measure dy, the resulting change in the y-axis, and the derivative is the ratio dy by dx as dx approaches zero. A different way to consider the derivative is the expression dy is equal to f prime of x dx. Quick side note, this is called a differential. It's a bit more complicated than moving around dy by dx as a fraction. What exactly is it saying? To visualize it, let's break apart the Cartesian axes. This gives us two number lines, an input space and an output space. If I place a point x on the input space, this point is mapped to another point on the output space, f of x. Now what our differential tells us is that if we were to take some small step dx, the resulting step dy equals the derivative of f of x times dx as dx approaches zero. Let's consider the function f of x is equal to x squared. We know its derivative is f prime of x is equal to two x. Writing it out in differential form, we get dy is equal to 2x dx. Now I'm going to draw a bunch of evenly spaced points on the input space and their corresponding mapping on the output space. I can even draw a line from each input point to the corresponding output point to make the visualization easier. Now, if I zoom into the input space at x is equal to 1 and play out the transformation, we can see that the points appear to be upscaled by a magnitude of 2. This is what it means for f of x to have a derivative of 2 at x is equal to 1. Looking at the differential for x is equal to 1, we have dy is equal to 2 times dx. Similarly, if we look at x is equal to 2, we can see that the points are being scaled by a magnitude of 4, which means that the derivative at x is equal to 2 is 4. And furthermore, if I were to check x is equal to negative 1, it appears that the points are being scaled by a factor of negative 2. This view of the derivative extends really well to complex functions. Let's consider a complex function f of z. Given that our inputs and outputs now lie in the complex plane, we have two complex planes to work with the input space and the output space. It's kind of hard to wrap your head around the first time, at least for me, since we don't have a direct visual. Instead, we're taking some input point and moving it around this 2D input space 
and looking how the corresponding output point moves around in the 2D output space. The point in the output space has a special term, the image of Z. Let's try and build up the same visual we had with the real derivative. From before, we have the input space and the output space, both of which are complex planes. Let's consider a point Z and its image f of Z. In the real case, taking a small step dx was easy enough. We either went left or right. But here in the complex case, we have infinitely many directions to choose from. For now though, let's choose some arbitrary direction and consider dz and the resulting image df. Keep this in mind, the change df is the change dz as dz approaches 0, which is why we can approximate them using vectors. I want you to notice how everything we're doing is analogous to the real derivative. Let's consider the differential in complex space, df is equal to f prime of z dz. This is telling us that df is equal to dz times some complex coefficient f prime of z. But what exactly are the effects of multiplying by a complex number? Consider a multiplication z times w, where z and w are complex numbers. We're trying to understand z's effect on w. To do this, we can express z and w in polar form, giving us z is equal to r1 e to the i theta 1, and w is equal to r2 e to the i theta 2. Multiplying these two, we get r1 r2 times e to the i theta 1 plus theta 2. This tells us that the resulting product sums the angles and multiplies the magnitudes. So z's effect on w is to multiply w's magnitude by z's magnitude, or scale w, and add z's angle to w's angle, or rotate w. In other words, we can describe complex multiplication as a transformation that scales and rotates complex numbers. So back to the derivative. In this example, we can see df is some result of scaling and rotating dc. In other words, df is the result of multiplying dc by some complex number f prime of z. But we've chosen some arbitrary direction for dc. What we need to consider is each and every direction for dc and their resulting image df. What it means for a derivative to exist at this point is for every single image df to have the same scaling and rotating factor. In this case, each dz is being rotated clockwise by roughly 2 pi over 5 and being scaled by roughly 1.15. Since every dz has the same rotating and scaling factor, this means that the derivative exists at z. The value of the derivative is this scaling factor, which we can write out as 1.15 times e to the 2 pi over 5 i. In rectangular form, this is 0.38 minus 1.09 i. Let's consider another example, g of z. Here, the scaling and rotation factor is not constant across all dg. For instance, this dg is being rotated by pi over 6 and being scaled by 2, while this dg is being rotated by pi over 6 but is being scaled by 0.5. This is what it means for a derivative to not exist at a point. Let that sink in for a bit. It's the same idea we had with the real derivative. Complex functions that are differentiable are called holomorphic functions. And even though every df being scaled and rotated by the same factor may seem like an oddly specific property to satisfy, most of the functions you can think of, like sine of z, e to the z, z squared, satisfy this property. I want to show you a different way to visualize complex differentiation. Given that we're going from a 2D space to another 2D space, we can also visualize complex functions as a transformation of a complex plane. You can think of this as passing all the grid lines I'm drawing through the complex function. In other words, I'm moving every point in the complex plane to its corresponding output point. For instance, let's try the function f of z is equal to 1 plus root 3i times z, which is a constant times the input.
Notice how it's a scaling of 2 along with the rotation of pi over 3. This is the same to what we discussed when multiplying complex numbers. If we express 1 plus root 3i in polar form, we get 2 e to the i pi over 3. Now, let's try the function f of z is equal to z squared. You can focus on the points I've plotted. Notice how 1 goes to 1, i goes to negative 1, and 2 goes to 4, like you would expect. Now what would a derivative look like in this case? Let's try and zoom in on some point z is equal to minus 1 plus 2i. For a derivative to exist, this zoomed in transformation must look like some complex multiplication, a scaling and rotation. This is the same thing I showed you earlier with dc, but instead of drawing vectors, we're considering a transformation of space. The derivative of f of z is equal to z squared is 2z, giving us f prime of negative 1 plus 2i is equal to negative 2 plus 4i, which is a scaling by 2 root 5 and a rotation by roughly 117 degrees. Playing out the transformation, that's exactly what we get. In other words, if we were to consider a complex function to be a transformation, what it means for a derivative to exist is that if we zoom into a point close enough, the transformation at this particular point looks like some scaling and rotation. And the value of the derivative is the complex number that brings about the scaling and rotation. Let's try a different example. Focus on the point 1 plus i. The derivative is 2 plus 2i, which in polar form is 2 root 2 times e to the i pi over 4. So, we should expect a rotation by pi over 4 and a scaling by 2 root 2. Playing out the transformation. That's exactly what we get. Here's what a non-differentiable function would look like. Notice how the rotation of the axes is different. In other words, there's a shear. This is not constant rotation and scaling, so it is not a complex multiplication. You may have also heard of holomorphic functions to be angle-preserving. Let's consider two lines that intersect at a point C and an angle theta. What angle preserving means is that if I were to pass these two lines through a function f of z, the angle phi formed by these lines is equal to theta, as long as f is differentiable at z. This can be seen through our complex transformation visual. Looking at f of z is equal to z squared, notice how all the right angles in the input grid are preserved. And this is a consequence of a rotation and scaling view. If all the small changes dc are being rotated by the same angle, the angle must be preserved, right? This angle-preserving fact is called conformality, and the functions are called conformal maps. Keep in mind, this angle-preserving property only works for non-zero derivatives. Note, this doesn't go both ways. If a function is conformal at a point, it is not necessarily differentiable. In this example here, the angles are preserved, yet these two vectors have different scaling factors. I'm not going to go into too much depth as to the further requirements to make a function differentiable, but essentially what we're looking for is for the function to be conformal throughout an infinitesimal neighborhood of z. I've left a link in the description if you want to learn more about this. As for calculation, it's identical. All the rules like the chain rule, the product rule, still apply to complex derivatives. If you're up for the challenge, try proving these rules using the visuals I showed you before. Let me know how it goes in the comment section. Take a moment to recall what we did. 
we started with the real derivative and we used two different number lines to express it as a transformation. By zooming in, we were able to see that the derivative is the scaling factor of some tiny step dx to some tiny step dy. Then we used the same intuition for complex inputs. We started by considering some arbitrary direction and taking a step dc, then noticing how it's being scaled and rotated, which is the same as multiplying by a complex number, and that for a derivative to exist, all the scaling and rotation should be the same across all directions. Then we use the same knowledge on a complex transformation, showing that zooming in should show some complex scaling. Let's try and build up a systematic way of determining if a function is holomorphic. If you're familiar with some linear algebra, the zoomed in transformation I showed you might look oddly similar to a linear transformation. And this is true, in fact the matrix performing this transformation has a special name, the Jacobian matrix. Let's try to derive the values of this matrix. Let's consider a function f of x plus yi is equal to u plus vi. Here, u and v are functions that take in a complex number x plus yi and output a real number each. The input space is a complex plane with axes labeled x and y, and the output space is a complex plane with axes labeled u and v. Let's consider a point z, its output f of z, a small change dz, and the resulting change df. We can break dz into dx and dy. Similarly, we can break df into du and dv. What we're trying to figure out is a matrix transformation from dz to the resulting infinitesimal vector df. We can write out dz as a vector dx dy, and we can write out df as a vector du dv. Remember, this matrix is called the Jacobian matrix. Let's focus on the change du. We can write this out as a change in u from dx plus the change in u from dy. This makes sense. The change in u comes from two parts, a change in x and a change in y. Given that these are both differentials, we can write this out as the derivative of u with respect to x times dx plus the derivative of u with respect to y times dy. This is the exact same thing as df is equal to f prime of z dc. We're just using partial derivatives to set a variable constant when we take each derivative. The same thing applies for dv, but now we're taking the derivative of v instead of u. If I write out both the equations, well this looks like a matrix multiplication. writing it out, we get this matrix product. This matrix is called the Jacobian matrix. But we also know that this matrix transformation can't be any linear transformation. It has to look like multiplying a complex number. This means that the scale produced along the x-axis should be equal to the scale produced along the y-axis. In addition, we need the angle generated by i hat and j hat to be the same. Given these conditions, we can algebraically calculate the values of our complex multiplication matrix. Let's multiply a plus bi times x plus yi, with x plus yi being the complex number we are operating on, and a plus bi being the complex number we are scaling by. Multiplying out, we get ax minus by plus bx plus ay times i. Considering each complex number to be a vector with the first element being the real component and the second element being the imaginary component, this product corresponds to the matrix A minus B, B A. Now we're ready to put these two together. We know both the Jacobian matrix and the complex multiplication matrix should be equal. 
since the top left of the complex multiplication matrix and the bottom right are A and A respectively, it means that the top left of the Jacobian matrix, the partial derivative of U with respect to X, should be equal to the bottom right of the Jacobian matrix, the partial derivative of a V with respect to Y. Similarly, the top left and the bottom left of the complex differentiation matrix are negative V and B respectively, and so, the top left of the Jacobian matrix, the partial derivative of U with respect to Y, should be equal to the negative of the bottom left of the Jacobian matrix, the partial derivative of V with respect to X. These are the renowned Cauchy-Riemann equations. We can check if any function is holomorphic or differentiable using these equations. If a function satisfies these equations, it is holomorphic and vice versa. Here, an example helps. Consider f of z is equal to z squared. Plugging in x plus y i and doing the algebra, we get x squared minus y squared plus 2xy times i. Let's check if it satisfies the Cauchy-Riemann equations. The partial derivative of u with respect to x is 2x, and the partial derivative of v with respect to y is 2x, and they're equal. The partial derivative of u with respect to y is negative 2y, and the partial derivative of v with respect to x is 2y, which is its negative. And so we've shown that z squared is holomorphic. Let's try a counterexample. A mapping we can consider is the complex conjugate of z, which is written with a bar on top of z. This mapping takes in x plus yi and returns x minus yi. Taking the partial derivative of u with respect to x gives us 1, and taking the partial derivative of v with respect to y gives us negative 1. And since these aren't equal, the Cauchy-Riemann equations aren't satisfied and this mapping is not holomorphic. I want to end by showing you the derivative of e to the z. But before I show it to you, I want to show you an application of conformal maps. Given a sphere, in this case the Earth, what's the best way to project the surface of the sphere onto a flat plane, giving us a map of the Earth? Well, best is subjective, but one of the ways to do this is to apply the idea of conformal maps to something called stereographic projection, which maps the surface of a sphere onto the entire xy plane. Using this particular projection, we can preserve the angles between the latitude and the longitude lines. This takes me to this video sponsor, Brilliant. One of their main values is for the content they teach to be applicable, and in my opinion, it's significantly easier to learn a topic with some motivation or application, for example, conformal maps and stereographic projection. This particular topic is covered in their Differential Equations 2 course, which goes over PDEs. Brilliant focuses on interactability, which is something impossible through my videos. I can't stress how useful these applets are for learning. Playing with this one in particular for stereographic projection really helped me understand where each point is going. They have courses for all branches of math and STEM in general, for all levels, ranging from statistics and analysis to computational biology and quantum physics. So if you're interested, you can go to brilliant.org slash vcubingx and sign up for free, and let them know that you came from me. And if you want to purchase a premium subscription, the first 200 people to sign up using my link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. Once again, thank you to Brilliant for their support. Back to the E to the Z. We know that e to the z is its own derivative, so if I were to zoom into a point z, the transformation would look like being multiplied by e to the z. Try and verify it as I play the animation out. If you made it this far, please consider subscribing. It helps me out a ton. I know I haven't been the most consistent with these videos, but I'm trying my best. Either way, I appreciate you guys for supporting me, and thanks for watching.